Launching the Antiquities Act of 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt created the nation's first national monument designation, Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming. The important purpose of this act was to preserve, for all Americans, significant pieces of the country's history. Ecology. Geology. And beauty. But unlike America's great national parks, size is not important for monuments. Historic sites and other units of the national park system Monuments are typically established by presidential proclamation, chosen as their personal memorials of the most special parts of this great country. However, occasionally these units of the park system are established by the direct action of Congress. Some are big, some are small. Some garner large budgets and staff, others next to none. And some eventually gain national park designation. America's treasures tell the story of the nation's past and present glory. America has been blessed as a land rich in fossils fossils that tell the story of the animals, plants, and ecosystems that set the stage for the world we live in today. America's great natural history museums display many of the great treasures from the country's ancient paleontological past. Fossil fish, giant mammals, invertebrates, plants, and of course, everybody's favorite, dinosaurs. The National Park Service has taken great care in preserving some of the nation's most important precious fossil resources. Indeed, two fossil rich resources stand out in the National Park System. Monuments that take you up close and personal with fossils still in the earth. Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument and Dinosaur National Monument. Tucked away in the northeast corner of the Colorado Plateau is some of the most beautiful land in the American West, part of which is contained within Dinosaur National Monument, a monument including parts of Colorado and Utah that was established in 1915 by President Woodrow Wilson to preserve 150 million year old Jurassic dinosaur fossil beds. Fossil beds discovered in 1909 by paleontologist Earl Douglas. Unlike most of the colorful Colorado Plateau, whose rock layers are horizontal and undisturbed by the forces of mountain building, the earth here is distorted, bent, and folded. Sonia Popelka, head interpretive ranger at the monument, knows why this part of the plateau is different. 
you see things like the Grand Canyon where the layers are still horizontally bedded. In this case, we have rock layers that are tilted on their side or tilted the other way um, or sometimes completely offset. And that's because Dinosaur National Monument is located on the extreme northern end of the Colorado Plateau and some other influences. We have the Rocky Mountains. But we also have the Uinta Mountains. It was squishing these rock layers in between. So otherwise flat layers buckled. And so we have ridges and we have dips and we have faults. So the otherwise nice and orderly uplift that you can see in other places gets all jumbled up together here. Of all the colorful rock formations here, the one sought out by dinosaur hunters is the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation is best known for its Jurassic Age dinosaurs. The best known dinosaurs to come out of the Morrison Formation, Stegosaurus, which is the state fossil of Colorado. Allosaurus is the state fossil of Utah. And then we also have the really giant long neck, long tail sauropods, like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and Camarasaurus. The climate here today has hot and dry summers and cold winters, a high desert ecosystem. But during the Jurassic Age of dinosaurs, it was very different. The landscape represented by the Morrison would be very different from the, both the weather patterns, the climate, and the topography that we have today. It was in a basin area where things were collecting, and so that made it possible for layers of muds and ash and gravels to build up and build up and build up over time. The climate was semi-arid and we were closer to the equator also at this time, so it would have been warmer year-round. The highlight of the monument is the quarry exhibit hall. Climate controlled, it was built in 1957 to house the 150 foot long quarry surface, strewn with more than 1,500 fossilized dinosaur bones, including Camarasaurus, Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, and other dinosaurs. Because the surface here containing the bones, which was once horizontal, is now tilted almost upright by the ancient mountain building process, visitors have a window into the Jurassic past. Literally, a wall of dinosaur bones. Sonia took us on a tour of the exhibit hall. It started with the touch wall, a place where children and people of all ages can touch a real dinosaur bone. Dinosaur National Monument is famous for 10 different species of dinosaurs, all from the Jurassic period, disarticulated skeletons all jumbled together in an ancient riverbed. At Dinosaur, you not only get to see this window into the Jurassic world, but you also get to touch it. One section of this wall is open as the touch wall, where you can get a feel for the difference between the sandstone itself, really rough, coarse-grained sandstone, which which has the clues embedded in it that this is from a river environment. And then dinosaur bones, such as giant femur from sauropods or four-legged plant eaters that would have roamed the planet 150 million years ago. We've got femurs, humerus, ribs, vertebrae, and it, just because they're close together now doesn't mean that they even came from the same animal. Here's a good collection of different bones from several different animals. This would be from the arm or the front leg of a sauropod. We have a rib from yet another. And then the shoulder blade or scapula, we have not only one, but two. Paleontologists have studied these bones and identified them and cataloged them. In the entirety of the Carnegie Quarry that exists and is protected here at the Quarry Exhibit Hall, there are over 1,500 individual dinosaur bones, and they've all been cataloged to species and type of bone as long as enough information is known. How did these dinosaurs die 149 million years ago? And why did they end up here? and appear as a jumble of bones. 
We may never know the exact cause of death. Uh, we estimate most of these dinosaurs died because of exhaustion and dehydration. Uh, large animals looking for water would have come to the edge of the river and died either near or even in the dried up riverbed. Um, that made the perfect location for their bodies to decompose just a little bit, uh, for water in the river to come and bury them with sands and gravels and carry the bones. Um, water can be extremely powerful when it gets moving fast enough. And something along the way just blocked up the bones like a log jam. So what we have here at Dinosaur is a log jam of dinosaur bones. There is a second floor viewing area to get you closer to the top of the wall, including the most prized dinosaur on display, a relatively complete individual, a long-necked plant-eating Camarasaurus. This particular individual Camarasaurus was um, dead, decomposing, but not transported, not jumbled as much as some of the other dinosaurs here. Uh, it's also in a section of the rock that's a little closer to us, which indicates that in the layering of this river system, there's multiple episodes of flooding and drought, and flooding and drought. This isn't just an instantaneous event uh, that is recorded here in the sandstone. It's probably multiple events that happened over 100 years, or maybe even 150 years. And the Camarasaurus up there is probably one of the younger of the dinosaurs that are exposed here in the monument. Up at the top right of the ridge, we have a section of vertebrae from a tail. And then this next sweep and curve of vertebrae, they start bigger and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Those are the vertebrae from the neck. There's actually a tilted and little squished skull uh, at the end of that. That's the second skull that's here on the wall still. Closer to us, we have a little section of vertebrae that are pretty big. Those are from the back or the spine and long, skinny, curved bones coming down there, which would be this Camarasaurus's ribs. We even have a part of a leg down here where the largest bone in the body, the femur, is exposed in this rock. Probably the most photographed fossil in this quarry exhibit hall is the skull of Camarasaurus, which is right on the top of the wall. You can see its neck coming down and then the skull with teeth even exposed. This is one of the sauropods, one of the four-legged plant eaters uh, that are here at the monument. And Camarasaurus is the single most plentiful dinosaur that's found here in this particular exposure of the Morrison Formation. In addition to the magnificent scenery and the one-of-a-kind dinosaur bones, the monument is also home to some of the most fabulous Native American rock art in the West. Rock art from the Native American culture that archaeologists named the Fremont culture, originally living in South Central Utah. Contemporaries of the ancestral Pueblo cultures sometimes called the Anasazi, the Fremont lived in small groups and did not build large permanent homes. Multiple locations in the monument contained wonderful examples of their petroglyphs and pictographs, human figures with trapezoidal bodies, bodies that may or may not include limbs, and elaborate symbols and decorations suggesting headdresses, earrings, and necklaces, shields, geometrical forms, and animals. One site known as Cub Creek is most remarkable. After a long and somewhat rugged climb to reach a ledge up against a wall, one views a canvas for several large, magnificent lizard figures. Lizard figures not found anywhere else in the area. 
One last look at Dinosaur National Monument as gleeful children experience their lifelong dream to be near real dinosaur bones. Dinosaur National Monument, one of America's greatest fossil treasures. In 1806, the great American explorer, Zebulon Pike, during his trek across the Great Plains towards the Rocky Mountains, spotted in the distance an impressive peak that looked like a small blue cloud. Pike called it Grand Peak. However, it would eventually be named Pike's Peak in his honor. Pikes Peak is the highest summit of Colorado's southern front range of the Rocky Mountains. This amazing 14,115-foot mountain looms over Colorado's Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument. A treasure trove of fossil insects, plants, fish, spiders, and giant redwood tree stumps, all collected from a 34 million year old ancient lake that existed here for a short time during the Rocky Mountains uplift. The monument was established in 1969 by President Richard Nixon after local citizens and concerned scientists petitioned for the site to be protected from development due to its paleontological importance. The significance of Florissant really lies in several factors, I think. Um, one is the, the size of the petrified trees here, which rival in diameter um, any others in the world in terms of how large these petrified trees are. But I think even more so, the significance of Florissant lies in the diversity that we see here, the richness of the number of species that are preserved. Um, currently, there are about 1,800 species that are still currently valid in the scientific literature. And so if you compare that to other fossil sites anywhere around the world, that's really extremely high diversity. Since the monument's establishment, over 15,000 fossil specimens have been collected and curated from the site. Dr. Herb Meyer is the world's greatest expert on this significant fossil resource. He describes how the fossil lake came to be. It all started with a period of intense volcanism 37 million years ago. By about 34 or 35 million years ago, there was another volcano that developed here, and that was a stratovolcano or composite volcano, which is similar to some of the modern volcanoes that you see in the Cascade Range today, like Mount St. Helens or Mount Hood or Mount Rainier. And that volcano uh, produced what are called lahars or volcanic debris flows or mud flows that came off the slopes of the volcano when, um, when it became saturated with water and those flowed down into the drainages and they were um, moving at speeds of maybe five to um, 30 or 40 miles an hour or more came through the valley and initially um, those buried um, some of the petrified trees that you see um, here. Um, one of those lahars also impounded the stream uh, valley or the stream drainage and formed a natural dam and behind that dam a lake formed and in that lake there was sedimentation that buried some of the organisms that were living around the lake. Many insects um, were incorporated into that and became fossilized, also leaves and flowers and fruits. Um, not so many mammals, Florissant is not well known for mammals but there were fish and there have been a number of um, significant birds that have been found here as well. When ancient Lake Florissant existed here during the Eocene epoch 34.9 million years ago, the climate and ecosystem were very different. The composition of the forest here at that time was really um, very different than what we see here today. Um, today it's a forest that's dominated by uh, ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, so it's a, a montane forest here today. The ecosystem 34 million years ago um, was much more diverse. There were many more species here. Um, it was a um, broadleaf forest that had some conifers in it, so those conifers include the really tall redwoods like you see here with the 
petrified stumps. We also find the foliage of those in the lake shales. Um, there's another tall con conifer called um, Camacyparis that was growing here at that time as well. But a lot of broadleaf plants, um, things like um, maples and some that are extinct plants, extinct members of the elm family, uh, extinct members of the beech family. Those are among the more dominant plants here today. So a lot of those were deciduous plants and shed their leaves into the lake. I think that the climate here was warm temperate would be the general way to describe it. The highlight of the monument is a hike along the one mile wheelchair accessible petrified forest trail. Along the way, you can see the surrounding mountains, the montane ecosystem plants, as well as the surrounding Ponderosa pine forest. On the Petrified Loop Trail, Dr. Meyer brought us to what is known as the Big Stump. It's actually not the largest in diameter at Florissant, but that's the name that it has. And there's a lot of history behind this one. It was first found in, um, certainly by the early 1870s, and there was an effort then by the 1880s to cut this tree into pieces with the objective of taking it to the World's Fair in Chicago in the early 1890s. And so there, were, there was an apparatus that was set up around this with saw blades and they started cutting into the tree. And you can still see the remnants of some of those saw blades today where they broke off. So the effort failed and the tree is fortunately still here at Florissant. Um, we've done some modeling to try to estimate how much this weighs, and it comes in at about 130,000 pounds, about 65 tons. So <clears throat> that in itself shows that this effort to cut it into pieces and load it on the train and take it back east was probably futile from the beginning. But it failed, and we still have the big stump here at Florissant. The only real estimate that's been made for the age of the trees when they, when they were living is one that was done by McGinnity, who was one of the paleobotanists here. And by counting growth rings, he estimated that some of them were probably about 500 to 700 years old. There is another story to be told at Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument. The story of pioneer homesteader and rancher Adeline Hornbeck. Her 1878 cabin is a testament to the Homestead Act of 1862, which allowed even American women to gain ownership of land for free if they were able to successfully work and improve it. What you're looking at here is actually the original 1878 built homestead home of one Adeline Hornbeck. The add-on piece is also original. That was 1909. That's the pump room that was added on 1909 by friends of the family purchased the place after Adeline's death in 05. What else you're seeing here on the homestead is a bunkhouse, also a purpose-built homestead home. You're seeing the carriage house here in the middle, and you're seeing the barn on the end. What else you see that is original is the position of the root cellar that is up on the ridge that line there. That's the original position of the root cellar. What you do not see here on the homestead is her corral and a couple more outbuildings up on the hill as that's where Adeline kept her horses. It's actually said that Adeline had, by the one year mark, uh, up to 50 head of cattle, 50 chickens, five milking cows, and up to 50 horses. So by the one year mark, she actually proved that she was in fact bettering the land under that Homestead Act is what they had to prove. You had to have a permanent structure, one door, one window and better the land. And that's what Adeline proved in her one year tax. Less than five minutes from the Hornbeck cabin on the northern edge of ancient Lake Florissant is Florissant Fossil Quarry. a private fossil collecting quarry that has been in the Clare family for over 50 years. Working hand in hand with the monument, some of the specimens found at this location are on display in the monument's visitor center and fossil repository. But it is also a place where anyone can collect these remarkable fossils 
for a small fee. We visited the quarry to get a look at the fluorescent shales that contain the fossils. We were met by two generations of Claire's, Dixie and Ryan. About 30 years ago, about the time that the national park turned into a national park, um, no one was able to collect there anymore. So what happened is my parents, my father was retiring from the post office, and um, they decided to open this up and let people come in and have the experience of hands-on collecting. Since my father's passed, my mom is still alive, and um, we, uh, we try to maintain what they started and let people come and, and just have some fun. So when people come here, the shale has been excavated out and they uh, just gather pieces of shale and split them open. As the material dries, it cures and we're able to split open the layers. Uh, for the most part, collectors that come here can keep the fossils that they find. We find a lot of plant material. We also find um, insects, quite a few insects. Uh, we do find occasionally vertebra fossils and those most all have been turned over to science. So this is the, um, the spot where we actually excavate the shale out. Um, this represents the entire formation of the uh, fluorescent, the fluorescent formation. Um, you can see the different layers. Every one of those layers can potentially have fossils in them. Every one um, represents a different eruption of the volcano. There is a thick crumbly layer up towards the top. That's actually the lahar or the mud layer that flowed into the lake. Those layers or, or that phenomenon is what caused the lake to change shapes. Ryan split some shale looking for a fossil to show us. A fossil plant. A fossil that may someday end up in the collections at Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument.